I am Joel Burkle. I am an associate professor in orthopedics, uh, and I have a joint appointment in bioengineering at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so I do research in the, the School of Medicine, and I teach uh, in the engineering school. I was, a, I was a mechanical engineering student. I, I got my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and, and wanted to continue that, uh, but got sort of introduced to this idea that you can apply engineering principles to, to biological things. And so um, I, I ended up going to Georgia Tech for graduate school uh, and worked with Bob Goldberg. Um, and uh, maybe I'll tell this story. So uh, when, I, I did my PhD with Bob on, on mechanical effects and bone healing and, and bone regeneration. Um, and then I decided that I would go uh, learn some cell biology. And so I went off and did a postdoc. Um, but during my postdoc, uh, I was at an ORS meeting um, and Bob introduced me to Lou Soslowski, who is the vice chair for research uh, in orthopedics here at Penn. Um, and Lou told me that they were, they were recruiting uh, junior faculty, and I was um, <laughs> I, I was not quite ready at the time, or at least I hadn't put a lot of thought into it. Um, but I was I was excited, and I said yes, I'd love to come interview. Um, and so I came, and I, I gave a a job talk, and that went fine. And then I gave this chalk talk, um, and it was terrible. It was the worst chalk talk in the history of chalk talks. Um, and and at my exit interview, Lou sets me down and he says, so Joel, how do you think that went? And I said, not great. And he says, oh, good. I'm glad you know. Um, but then he said, hey, if you if you went back and worked on it a little bit, do you think you could do a better job? Um, and so I I said, wow, that that would be great. Uh, I think I absolutely I can do that. So I went back to, to Cleveland um, and I gathered some mentors who who helped me kind of think through my my terrible chalk talk. Um, and I came back and I did it again. And then um, th they they were generous enough to give me an offer. Um, but at the time, I'd, I also, in this interim, I, I got an offer from the University of Notre Dame. Um, and and I had this desire to teach. Um, and this position at, at Penn was, was you know, 100% research. And so I... Um, I, I called Lou on the very last day that, that he'd given me, like, this is the deadline I need to know. And I, uh, I, I said, Lou, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to come. Um, and then uh, I went off to Notre Dame and, and um, kind of found myself as a scientist. Um, and then there were some, there were some, you know, family reasons that, that meant we, we needed to, we needed to move to a city. And so I, I, uh, I came back to Lou at the ORS meeting a few years later, and I said, "Lou, I made a terrible mistake." <laughs> and I said, Can, are, are, is, "Is there any chance you're still hiring?" Um, and he says, "Well, as a, as a matter of fact, I've I've been uh, we've been developing this program where we'll we want to bring in jointly appointed uh, assistant professors who will build bridges between the engineering school and the med school, um, and so." Uh, I, I got this opportunity to come to Penn, um, where I, I get to run my lab and also also continue to teach. Um, and so, you know, I, I constantly sort of pinch myself because who gets these kinds of opportunities, right? But it's it's really delightful to to be in orthopedics. Um, yeah, I, I would call myself a mechanobiologist. You know, I, I was trained as a mechanical engineer and I sort of thought of myself as an engineer, but, but my postdoc in, in cell biology really uh, opened my eyes to new kinds of questions. And, um, and, and now my lab works mostly on sort of fundamental mechanobiology problems uh, in the context of embryo development and, and tissue regeneration. And so we study bone development and repair. We study uh, tendon and ligament mechanobiology. Um, we study angiogenesis and blood vessel development and angiogenesis during uh, vascularized tissue regeneration. Uh, so those are those are the uh, the variety of things we're interested in. But we we really we sort of like to take problems and say, okay, what's the most interesting question we can ask, and then go find the tools to solve those problems. Um, and and it's it's been a lot of fun because we've we've stumbled into a lot of things that I never would have guessed that we'd be working on. You know, a, a few years ago, I stumbled across this article in the New York Times, um, and they showed this map. 
And the map has different regions of the United States. And I think it's probably true for the whole world, but, but this is data is for the United States. I have this map of the United States where it shows for different regions, what's the median distance that, the per, that people in this region live from their mother. Um, and in the Northeast, it's like eight miles. Um, out West, it's a little bit further, but, the, but if you take the whole United States, the median distance that people live from their mother is 18 miles. Um, which, which means that, you know, most people live close to home. Um, but for scientists, this is not true, right? I was at a, I was at a meeting where, uh, they asked all of the speakers to do an intro slide and they had one of the things that they suggested you do is put a list of all the different places that you've lived. And every single speaker has this long list of different countries and different states and different places that they've lived. And chances are good that you don't, you don't live where you started out, um, and and this is this is I think this is one of those things that's really hard about science that you you end up sort of living this nomadic lifestyle and you 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 don't end up living near your family. Um, but one of the things that I love about the ORS um, and and sort of scientific culture more broadly uh, is that you you end up finding your people uh, that you get to see on a regular basis, right? I, I see I, I some of my dearest friends in the world. Are folks that I know through the ORS, um, and I see them multiple times a year because of these our, our interactions in science, um, and and these kinds of relationships are so meaningful, um, and and they they sort of make up for the fact that you you don't live live near your family, you have a different family. This is such a great question because there's. You know, I think my, my wife has this saying that everybody has their hard, everybody has something that, that is challenging and, and um, it, it's easy to think that either that you're the only person who has challenges or to, to um, sort of not understand what other people are going through. Um, but I wanna, I wanna highlight one that I think is sort of general to science um, and I call it the nonlinearity problem. Um, so, so I teach this class in nonlinear elasticity and it's a tissue mechanics class. Um, and the, these orthopedic tissues in our body, all these soft tissues are, are highly nonlinear. Um, and they, many of them have sort of exponential behaviors, right? And this is actually what science is like. Um, and so some, it can build, mix for some real challenges. Um, one example in my life was as a graduate student, you know, you start out, um, and you work really hard and you do experiments and you work late and you do all these things. Um, but it doesn't turn into, uh, you know, you don't get a linear return on, on your, your investment of energy. Um, and so, you know, I went three years with not a single experiment working. Um, and at the same time, your nonlinear lifestyle is is different than those of your peers, right? You see people go off and they get they get jobs that pay them enough to start families and have a house and all of these things, and and you feel like I'm here, I am stuck at the in the tow region of this nonlinear curve, um, and and that's hard. You know, I I almost I almost quit grad school at the time because I felt like am I going to even make it, right? Um, you know, another another place this is hard is when you make these transitions, like to postdoc. Um, I switched fields, and that means you start all the way back down at the beginning of the exponential curve, and you go. Um, and I, you know, honestly, I don't know that I ever felt like as a postdoc, like I made it out of the toe region. I felt like I I was still in the pouring in effort and not seeing any return on it. Um, and it wasn't until later that I could look back and realize like, oh man, I, that, those training experiences were formative in how I think about science and problems, right? Um, and so I guess the encouragement I want to give to folks who are in that nonlinear region um, is that, that, you know, it does, it does take off. Like you see this now that I get to sit on uh, PhD thesis committees, you see it take off in students and it's so awesome to watch. Um, and, um, so it, it does happen, but it, but it, it, it comes at a, at, at an exponential, uh, delay. Right. So, yeah, I think that's a, that's a challenge. Um, and it, it of course intersects and compounds with, 
with everything else that that people have going on in their lives. So I, I have a I have a perspective here that that I gained during during COVID. Um, but I'll, I'll begin with a little bit of biblical wisdom that I put on my syllabus for my for my continued mechanics class. Um, it's for my, my favorite Bible verse. It's Proverbs 25, 2. It goes, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, to search out a matter is the glory of kings. Um, and, and it used to be that the only people in the world who got to like do science is you got to be a king. You got to be independently wealthy and, and, and you have time on your hands. Um, and we have this privilege to be able to go do this. Right. Um, but, um, you know, during during COVID, some some folks like pivoted to working on COVID, and some people were like making nanoparticles that save the world, and you know, modifying RNA to make vaccines. Um, and I I didn't do that. I I became obsessed with reading these um, these books from these early nineteenth century cave explorers from France. Um, and they would they would write about how they would go explore these caves and they'd like put on a backpack full of candles and they'd wander into a cave um, and they'd lay out one candle after another and illuminate this cavern um, that nobody's ever seen before, right? And and so the they the way that they talk about the sublimity of this experience of seeing something that nobody's ever seen before is really amazing. Um, but they also talk about all these challenges that they have of exploring caves and not having the tools. And um, I, I, what I realized is that it's a lot like being a scientist where you have these punctuated moments of, of absolute sublimity, right? Where you see something nobody's ever seen before and it's amazing, but those are sort of rare. Like most of the time you're wandering around in the dark and, and you, you bonk your head and you stub your toes and, and you have that, you have those moments but then you don't hang out in the cavern. You like go find the darkest little corner with a bit of a draft where you think you can go deeper. And so you, you, you spend your time in the dark. Um, and, and I guess the advice that I want to give is like, it, it works best when you embrace the mystery of it, right? The uncertainty of it. Um, that, that, yeah, you, you, you celebrate those moments when things are amazing, right? Um, but, but also, uh, I think sometimes just knowing ahead of time that like I'm not I'm not stupid. It's just that I'm wandering around in the dark, um, and that's why that's why it's like this um, is is encouraging, right? You know, so I have I have three kids. Uh, Sean's twelve, Nora's nine, and Gracie's eight. Um, and so I love spending time with them. I love hiking with them, and the that we we. Um, every, every other summer we go to the ORS musculoskeletal biology workshop, um, and I bring the kids along and we go hiking and, um, those are, those are some of my favorite things. Um, I also really enjoy reading. Um, I, I love, I love novels mostly. Um, so right now I'm on sort of a Southern Gothic kick, but I, I love, uh, George Eliot, who's a, a Victorian novelist. Um, and, and she, if you haven't read Middlemarch, you should read, every, like, I feel like every scientist should read this book. Um, Cause the, one of the protagonists in the story is a, is a, a pathologist who decides he wants to dedicate his life to science. And so um, Elliot, when she was researching for the book, spent a bunch of time reading the Lancet um, and, um, and, and writes beautifully about science. And so I'll, I'll end with this quote from her. Um, she says, uh, the very breath of science is a contest with mistake and must keep the conscience alive. Um, and, and I think that's really beautiful, right? It's a contest with mistake. And sometimes it means you go down the wrong path in the cave uh, and you got to find your way back. Um, but it, it keeps the conscience alive. 